Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Before Coffee. I forgot what I was going to say just there. Today it's Thursday, June 29th, and we are going to find out any updates on any of the news from the past few days. Or maybe some new stuff is happening. We're here to report it, whether or not people want to talk about it. All right, you ready to go? Oh, sure. <laughs> as ready as you'll ever be, huh? Yeah, ready to go at 6.25. Okay. Okay. Today on Before Coffee. Wagner mutiny has weakened Putin, says Schultz, as Russian president makes rare public visit. We have train derailment news in the United States. France police shooting. Macron holds crisis meeting as officers are investigated. And we have smoke news from the United States. Malta to allow abortion, but only when women's life is at risk. And, and Maryland gets ready to legalize cannabis today on June 29th, 2023 edition of Before Coffee. Okay, well, let's start with our first news story here with the Wagner Mutiny. This is from Graham Russell and Agencies on The Guardian. Yeah. German yeah. Chancellor Olaf Scholz has said the failed Wagner Mutiny last weekend has weakened Vladimir Putin's authority as the Russian president sought to repair the damage to his standing by meeting military staff at the Kremlin and greeting crowds on a rare public walkabout. Speaking in a wide-ranging hour-long interview with the ARD broadcaster, Schultz said, I do believe he is weakened as this shows that the autocratic power structures have cracks in them, and he is not as firmly in the saddle as he's always stressed, or always asserts. Schultz, Schultz said in Wednesday's interview he did not want to join in speculation about how long Putin might remain in office, saying the West's aim in supporting Ukraine was to help it defend itself, not, not to bring about a regime change. The same day, Poon arrived in the remote southern region of Dagestan on the Caspian Sea, 2,000 kilometers from Moscow, and took a public tour, stopping to kiss fans, post her selfies, and shake hands with cheering crowds. He flew to the city of Durbant in the mostly Muslim region to mark the Islamic holiday of Eid al-Adha and to visit an ancient citadel and historic mosque. It was an unusual move for a secretive president who one senior security official once described as pathologically afraid for his life, requiring his staff to undergo a two-week quarantine during the pandemic. The length of the tables Putin used to greet foreign leaders last year was widely seen as both a power play and a way to socially distance himself for fear of infection. The Russian president has given a series of public addresses this week in a bid to repair his public standing and portray Wagner's march on Moscow as a moment that unified Russia. Putin's trip comes in amid question as to the whereabouts of a Russian general whose U.S. intelligence reportedly believed had prior knowledge of the uprising led by Wagner's chief, Yevgeny Prigozhin. Jan Sergei Sur Surovkin, who previously led the invasion force in Ukraine, has not been seen in public since Saturday. Surov Kin, who was called a legendary figure by Pyro Prigozhin upon his appointment, is now the subject of an unconfirmed report that he has been arrested. The well-publicized links between Surovkin and Prigozhin have fueled rumors that Surovkin may be purged or put under investigation for supporting the mutiny. Schultz said on Wednesday, the Wagner uprising was part of an internal Russian power struggle, and the West was not involved in it, echoing comments by U.S. President Joe Biden. Schultz said he spoke on Saturday to the leader of the U.S., France, and Britain, and Poland, and we quickly agreed to stay very quiet. We have nothing to do with this conflict in Russia. He said German intelligence did not have any prior knowledge of the rebellion. Asked if at any point on Saturday he had hoped the mutiny spelled the end of the Putin's rule, he said it would have made no sense as it was unclear if if what would have come after him would have been better. 
Asked about the impact of the mutiny on the Ukraine war, the German Chancellor said the precondition for successful peace talks was Russia accepting it needed to withdraw its troops from the country. Whether this has become easier or harder through these events is not really clear, he said, in the interview recorded on Wednesday afternoon. On the need to continue to help Ukraine, Schultz said, we must be prepared that it could take a long time. This was in association with Reuters and Associated Press. This article was written. So, Putin is, uh, you know, trying to remind people that he's a great guy that rules the country and didn't put his entire country in an unnecessary war for, what, gains in land? Land gain? I don't know what his, his actual final goal is here with invading Ukraine, but, uh... His own ego? Yeah, his own ego. Anyways, on to your next story. All right. And derailment news, hashtag derailments. <laughs> so you keep track of all the train derailments that seem like they're possibly catastrophic. This is from AP News. Model Park, California, in America. An Amtrak train carrying nearly 200 passengers struck a county water truck and derailed in on Wednesday in Southern California, critically injuring the truck's driver, authorities said. Three of the train's seven cars went off the tracks following the collision in Moore Park, said Ventura County Fire Department Captain Brian McGrath. The detailed, uh, the derailed train cars remained upright of the tracks adjacent to the orchard, adjacent to an orchard and bare sections of land. 14 people on the train were taken to hospitals with minor injuries, while the truck driver was taken to the trauma center with a head injury, McGrath said. Parts of the demolished Ventura Public Works trucks were scattered all around the derailed train cars. McGrath initially said the truck's driver was believed to have gotten out of the vehicle before the crash, but later clarified that the circumstances leading up to the wreck weren't known. No one's talked to him, so the whole situation is being investigated. And here's a picture of the truck. It's in several pieces. Because he got hit by a train. Mindy Farber was seated facing the rear of the train with her, after a trip with her mother. Sherry Peterson, returning a visit from her mother, Sherry Peterson, returning from visiting family in Oregon. All of a sudden, smack! Favor said, describing the impact. Then Favor saw what she later found out was a water tu- truck's tank tumbling past her window. Most of the passengers were able to get off the train cars on their own with the other first responders, McGrath said. TV news helicopters showed numerous people, many carrying luggage, milling about in the field as fire- firefighters worked on the scene. It could have been a lot worse, Favor told the Ventura County Star. The train was on its way to Los Angeles from Seattle when it struck a water truck obstructing the tracks at 11.15 a.m. This was yesterday, Amtrak said in a statement. There were approximately 198 passengers, 13 crew on board, who were evacuated from the train with no reports of serious injuries, the statement said. Amtrak is working with customers to make alternate travel arrangements. Amtrak, in coordination with local authorities, is conducting a full investigation. Crews are able to quickly adults a small fire. Well, they did have a water truck handy if they wanted to put the fire out. It's a joke. Moor Park is a city of some 35,000 people located about 50 miles northwest of downtown Los Angeles. And no deaths except for the fire truck, the, the truck driver who was injured and he's the one who basically caused it by parking on the tracks, so. We'll see what happens, but hopefully he recovers. Your story. All right. I'm sure, as you said before, there's always hundreds of train derailments every year, so there'll be more. There's there's literally a few every single day. Yeah. All right. So, in an update on the France police shooting... Macron is now holding a crisis meeting. This is from Angelique Chrysophis in Paris and other agencies. Emmanuel Macron has held a governmental crisis meeting after a second night of violent protests across France over the fatal police shooting of a 17-year-old boy at a traffic stop. 
These acts are totally unjustifiable, the French president said at the beginning of the meeting, which aimed at securing hotspots and planning for the coming days so full peace can return. At least 150 people were arrested in what the interior minister, Gerald Darmanin, called a night of unbearable violence against the symbols of the republic. Town halls, schools, police stations burned or attacked. Prosecutors said magistrates will investigate the police officer who shot the boy for voluntary homicide and the human right ombudsman has opened an inquiry. Protesters launched fireworks at police, set cars ablaze, and torched public buildings in towns in the suburbs around Paris, but also in the city of Toll House in the southwest and towns across the north. There were also disturbances in Amiens, Dijon, and at saint Etienne, and outside Lyon. Around Lyon, in Villeurbanne, Venice, I can't say that, it's French. <laughs> I can't say French words when they add S-I-E-U-X. I'm just like, no, I give up. And Braun, right. local media has reported burning barricades made of blazing bins and rental scooters. Blazing bins! Oh, is that the new, uh, is that a new, <laughs> is that the sequel to Blazing Saddles? <laughs> blazing <laughs> bins. The town hall is the Telhorn in Cages les Gornes. Outside Paris was set alight in a arson attack and in Mon et Bar. Oh God, I've never seen that. It's like an O and an E together as one letter. I don't know how to say that either. In Northern France, the town hall was torched and the mayor said several services had been totally destroyed. In Clamart, outside Paris, a tram was burned. Several police stations were attacked in towns around Paris, including in Trops. Genet Villers and Moudon. About 2,000 riot police were deployed in and around Paris on Wednesday night as protesters launched fireworks at police and set fire to cars in the town of Nanterre outside of the capital, where the 17 year old boy, Nahel, was shot dead at close range during a traffic stop on Tuesday. Police appeared at first to have lied about the circumstances of the killing. No kidding. When you're found guilty of murdering somebody, you go, oh no, it, uh, something else right. happened. Yeah, it was totally logical to murder someone. <laughs> yeah. French media report, report reported incidents in numerous locations across the greater Paris region. Videos on social media show dozens of fireworks being directed at the Montreux Town Hall on the eastern edge of Paris. Politicians were concerned that sustained rioting and unrest across France could be hard to contain. In 2005, the death of two young boys hiding from police in an electricity substation in clichy sous bois outside Paris triggered weeks of unrest, with France declaring a state of national emergency as more than 9,000 vehicles and dozens of public buildings and businesses were set on fire. The use of lethal force by officers against Nahel, who was a North African or from North African origin, has fed into a deep-rooted perception of police brutality in the ethnically diverse areas of France's biggest cities. We are sick of being treated like this. This is for Nahel. We are Nahel, said two young men calling themselves Avengers as they wheeled rubbish bins from a nearby estate to add to a burning barricade. One said his family had lived in France for three generations, but they are never going to accept us. In the 18th to 19th districts of northeastern Paris, police fired flash balls to disperse protesters who were burning rubbish. The crowd responded by throwing bottles. In Essonne region, south of the capital, a bus was set on fire after all the passengers forced off, police said. In Toulouse, several cars were torched and responding police and firefighters pelted with projectiles. On Wednesday, Macron called for a calm, telling reporters, we have an adolescent that was killed. It is unexplainable and inexcusable. Nothing justifies the death of a young man. His remarks were unusually frank in a country where senior politicians are often reluctant to criticize police, given the voters' security concern. The teenager had been driving a car on Tuesday morning when he was pulled over for breaking traffic rules, prosecutors said. Police initially reported that one officer had shot at the teenager because he was driving his car at him, but this version of events was quickly contradicted by a video circulating on social media that was authenticated, authenticated by French news agencies. Rights groups allege systematic, systematic racism inside law enforcement agency in France, a charge Macron has previously denied. Yassine Bo Bowsro, a lawyer for the boy's family, said, 
You have a video that is very clear. A police officer killed a young man of 17 years. You can see that the shooting is not within the rules. The family has filed a legal complaint against the officer for homicide, complicity in homicide, and false testimony, the lawyer said. Lawmakers held a minute, mi minute's silence, sorry I was in French for a second there, held a minute's silence in National Assembly where the Prime Minister, Elizabeth Bourne, said the shooting seemed clearly not to comply with the rules. In a video shared on TikTok, a woman identified as the victim's mother called for a memorial march in Nantere on Thursday. Everyone come, and we will lead a revolt for my son, she said. Tuesday's killing was the third failed shooting during the traffic stops in France, so far in 2023. Last year, there were a record of 13 such shootings, a spokesperson for the National Police said. There were three such killings in 2021 and two in 2020, according to Reuters Italy, which shows the majority of victims since 2017 were black or of Arab origin. The two leading police unions fought back against criticism, saying that the same police officer should be presumed innocent and unfound otherwise. Okay. Well, it's not the U.S., and France has a total different justice system, so good luck. I don't Most see, a, you know, I don't see any good positive uh, result from this. Just hopefully... Viva... Sorry? Viva, la... Viva Revolution! Yeah. Ho hopefully yeah. Nahel gets the justice he deserves, and uh, on to your next story. All right. Um, in Smokey News, I don't know if you want to have a video. I don't know if you see this. If you're wondering why, if you live in Wisconsin, there's no clouds in the sky and you still can't see the sun. I mean, there's oh, the yeah, sun. Look at that. That's how smoky it is here. Can you see those trees back there? Yeah. I, and also, way back. the sun is a good indicator of how smoky it is because it's yeah. orange. There's the, yeah, it's, there's no clouds blocking it at all. That's just smoke. All right, so if you're wondering, and you're in Wisconsin is wondering, like, it's summer, but I can't see the sun. Milwaukee experience from the Milwaukee Journal. Help me. Move my camera to suitable. Oh, now I'm blind. I'm seeing sunspots. Great. <laughs> Milwaukee experience, one of the worst air quality index in the world on Tuesday. It's from the Milwaukee Journal. Because of smoke from Canadian wildfires, Wisconsin DNR has issued an air quality advisory through Thursday afternoon, but expects hazy skies to improve by Wednesday afternoon. They didn't. Wildfires are common during the time of this time of the year when warmer, dry weather creates the perfect environment for blazes, especially in Canada's forests. However, devastation from this season fires has put the country in track from the worst wildfire seasons in recent years. The fires in their smoke pass have impacted several cities across North America since the beginning of the summer, most notably in New York City. Here's what to know about the wildfires. Canada's eastern provinces like Quebec, Ontario, and Nova Scotia have been hit particularly hard this year by large and at times uncontrollable blazes. As of excuse me, as of June 27th, there are 480 active fires across the country, with 251 out of control and 152 under control, according to the Canadian Interagency Forest Fire Center. Officials on Tuesday reported the highest number of active fires in Quebec, British Columbia, along Canada's west coast. So that we're, we might be getting this stuff from all the way from British Columbia, which is thousands of miles away. Had the second highest number of active blazes, followed by Alberta, which is also west of here, and Ontario, which is north of here. The fires have scorched at least 7.8 million hectares, or around 19. 0.2 million acres of land across Canada since the start of the year. According to the fire agency, the acreage has surpassed the previous annual record from 1989, reported by the National Forest Database. Canada is at a national preparedness level five, meaning that they have dedicated a full commitment of using national resources as well as international help to battle the fires. How did they start? Well, fires in Canada I thought they had started late April and grew more severe in early May, prompting a government response in May 6. Warm and dry conditions plus severe drought in densely forest areas due to large global warming have increased the chances of natural fire in recent years, according to the Canada, Canada Drought Monitor. All 10 can, Canadian provinces are experiencing abnormal dryness and moderate and severe drought. Dry hot weather also makes lightning more likely. 
In a normal season, half of Canada's wildfires are started by lightning, but those fires account for more than 85% of wildfire destruction. The other half are human caused in various ways, from discarded cigarette butts to sparks from passing trains. These fires have traditionally occurred in the country's west coast, but the spring, this spring has seen historic fire numbers on Canada's west coast. The wildfires are concentrated in British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Northern Territories in Western Canada, as well as Ontario, Quebec, and Nova Scotia in Eastern Canada, according to the Interagency Forest Fire Center, Forest Fire Center, which covers all of the provinces, I believe. So there we are. Canada's on fire until they get a lot of rain. I don't see a lot of relief in sight because it's like, who's setting all these fires? You get that. It's like, uh, nature's setting them. Come on. Your story. Nature is angry and we are going to be the, uh, what do you call the punishment for it? Or we're going to take the punishment for it. We shall pay. News from Malta. This is from the AP Associated Press in Valletta. Maltese lawmakers have unanimously approved legislation to ease the strictest abortion laws in the EU, voting to allow terminations, but only in cases where a woman's life is at risk. Ahead of the vote on Wednesday, pro-choice campaigners withdrew their support, saying last-minute changes make the legislation vague, unworkable, and even dangerous. The original bill, allowing access to abortion if a pregnant woman's life or health is in danger, was held as a step in the right direction for Malta, a majority Catholic country. It was introduced last November after an American tourist who miscarried had to be airlifted off the Mediterranean island nation to be treated. Under the, under the amendments, however, a risk to health is not enough. A woman, a woman must be at risk of death to be to have access to an abortion, and then only after three specialists consent. The new legislation allows a doctor to terminate a pregnancy without a specialist consult consultation only if the mother's life is an immediate risk. Thousands of Maltese protested against the law during the demonstrations in December. The governing Labour Party, which submitted the original bill, supported the amendment, while the opposition agreed to support it after the changes. The Voices of Choice coalition withdrew its support last week, calling the amendments a betrayal. The coalition of 14 pro-choice groups said the requirement for three specialists for women whose health is at risk was unworkable and dangerous. Malta had been the only EU nation to have prohibited abortion for any reason, punishable by up to three years in prison to have, the, to have the procedure or up to four years to assist a woman in having the abortion. The law is rarely enforced. The last known case of someone being jailed was in 1980. However, a woman was charged under the anti-abortion law this month, but not jailed. San Marino decriminalized abortion last year, and other majority Catholic countries such as Ireland and Italy have leg legalized it. In 2021, Poland introduced a near-total ban on abortion except for when a woman's life or health is in danger or if the pregnancy results from a rape or incest. The proposed Maltese legislation does not provide an exception for rape or incest. So, good job, Malta. You're a disappointment to everybody in the world. Uh, yeah, I'm also not a fan of her, like needing three different people to confirm hey this person's gonna die yeah because you know what's more important than you know a 20 or 30 year old person with all that knowledge and skill a infant with no mother that's really useful yeah. to society yeah. anyways yeah. i don't want to get too angry about this on to your next story <laughs> yeah next time i get pregnant i'll have an opinion on it right yeah exactly I'm a guy, you know. I I really don't. If you if you don't have a baby, don't have a baby. Period. Uh, maybe maybe there should be definitely should be restrictions. You can't just have a baby and just whack it on the chair. That's that's wrong, obviously. But that's not what ever happens. That's what they tell you happens. So just to scare you. What they're really doing is they rip the babies out of the womb and they put them on a train. <laughs> And they tell them they're going to be a movie star. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, I don't know. I can make up stories, too. Anybody can do it. Okay. Cannabis is going to be legal in Maryland starting on Saturday. So, I don't know. Everybody's going to lose their You can throw your medical card in the trash, I guess. I don't know. That's right. Everybody. everybody no, I guess, you get, I, I guess you get more and higher strains or something. I'm not exactly sure. Anyway, for the medical. Uh, but. Yeah. 
Everybody's going to be losing their keys Monday morning. You're late to work, boss. Couldn't find the keys. They were in my hand the whole time. Um, this is from Fox News in Baltimore. Starting on July 1st, the possession and use of small amounts of cannabis and cannabis products will be legal in Maryland. So what are the new rules? Well, let's find out. The People's Law Library of Maryland summarizes the new rule in the states. The People's Law Library is a legal information website run by Thurgood Marshall State Law Library, a court-related agency of the Maryland Judiciary. The information on the People's Law Library comes from legal service organizations throughout the state. Here is what they said about marijuana in Maryland. Possession. People 20 years and older can possess the following amounts starting July 1st, up to 1.5 ounces. That is a lot. Up to 12 grams of concentrated can cannabis, which is a lot. Cannabis products containing up to 75 milligrams of Delta 9 THC or up to two cannabis plants. I heard four. The lady at the dispensary told me four. Now it says two. Okay. Growing. For those looking to grow their own Maryland, grow their own, Maryland law said adults would be allowed to grow up to two plants that are out of public view and secured so they're not accessible by unauthorized individuals or those under age of 21. Sharing. Adults can now also share cannabis with friends. Oh, isn't that nice? I can share something that's legal with someone. The amount of oh, cannabis. The literal here. cult, like that's literally stoners for like decades sharing their weed with each other. And now it's legal. It's finally legal. <laughs> In fact, you better share that joint, dude. Amount of cannabis shared must not exceed the amount defined as personal use, and no money can exchange for cannabis. Transfer of cannabis and ex an excessive personal use amount or accepting a payment for transferred amounts may qualify as possession with the intent to distribute. I'm going to leave this at a table and walk away, and you leave that $500 on another table across the room. You know, I don't know. Just don't sell it. Yeah, who really cares about that stuff anyway? According to Maryland law, selling without a license is classified as a criminal misdemeanor and punishable up to three years in prison. Yeah. So get a license, so don't sell, I guess. So don't sell it, man. You don't yeah. sell beer to your friend. Here, here's a beer. Give me five bucks. <laughs> Maryland's new law is also prohibited specific locations for smoking cannabis in public places is one of them. Smoking cannabis in public places is considered to be a civil offense and be penalized the $50 fine first offense, Maryland. That's the dumbest law I've ever seen because most people are just going to be vaping in public. You don't know what the hell they're vaping. It could be anything. You're going to go, here's a $50 fine. Yeah, well, prove what that vapor was. It's up there. You know? Yeah. What a dumb law. I don't know what they're trying to prove by that, but it's a dumb law. They did that notion in Sydney. They said, oh, we're going we're gonna to ban people from smoking in public. Oh, yeah. No, you're not. People are just going to smoke vapes. For those looking to get a previous marijuana possession charge expunged, you are in luck. Although the expungement can happen, Maryland law said this is not automatic. The new law is individuals convicted of marijuana possession request an expungement after a successful completion of a sentence. Oh boy. Anyone looking for more information can find it online by the People's Law Library of Maryland. There you are, Sean. People's Law Library of Maryland. Okay. In cultural news, in cultural news, Twitter rips into Jeremy Corbyn's pretentious poetry. Except Ooh. it's actually by Shelley. Rise Ooh. like lions after slumber in unvanquishable number. Take your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep had fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. It's not the first time Jeremy Corbyn has quoted a ver quoted verses. Oh God, thirty-eight. No wait, wait, yeah, thirty-eight of Percy Bysshe Shelley's *Mask of the Anarchy*. He recited it on the pyramid stage at Glastonbury in 2017. In those innocent days, when singing "O oh, Jeremy Corbyn" to the tune of the White Stripes' Seven Nation Army was popular, and Boris Johnson had never presented his prime ministerial credentials to the Queen. 
Yesterday, Corbin posted the same verse on Twitter, using it to plug his and Len McCluskey's looming anthology, Poetry for the Many, which can be pre-ordered online by right-thinking lefties, though ideally you'd think not from Amazon. Twitter was not impressed with the poem, which alarmingly many took to be the work of the former labor leader and still MP for Islington North. Good heavens, this is bad, tweeted you the Quena. The whole poem is utterly dreadful and the Scansian is totally broken, but the use of ya is the most pretentious shit imaginable, tweeted Daniel Blake. Vogons wept, she added in another tweet. Vogons, you recall, are slug-like humanoids from Douglas Adams' The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. They destroyed Earth to build an intergalactic superhighway, and they are known for their bloody, awful poetry. And then the critic was mystified at the obsolete language. Why the ye, though? You would be fine. Why bring the ye? Perhaps the critic thought Corbin was name-checking Kanye West, which would be cool. Lady Contrary Mary tweeted, possibly correctly, this is a poem by someone who knows fuck all about lions. I'm going to go out on a limb and claim that Lady M Mary is no more an actual duologist than I am. Did Shelley know anything about lions? Does Corbin? And is this the line of criticism decisive in evaluating the poem's worth? These are deep questions for profounder minds like mine. Corbin's critics used the quote to revive some old complaints. A common theme was that he should be have rhymed do with not with few, but with a Jew, and gone on to make some anti-Semitic remark. But he didn't. Others quoted even worse, such as Baldrick from Black Adder, still poignant critique of the futility of the World War I, boom, 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 boom. Others began brightly with, there was an MP from Nantucket, but sadly didn't complete the rhyme. <laughs> What is striking about word. the response to Corbin's Shelley tweet is that it's not so much the lions that are rising in unvanquishable number on Elon Musk's platform, but the unapologetic age of stupid. Many years ago, the late Tro Tro Trotskyist journalist Paul Foote wrote a fine book about the Etonian atheist poetry's revolutionary, revolutionary credentials, entitled Red Shelley. You can see why Corbin is attached to the verse, which echoes his own campaign line. For the many, not the few. But why would anyone assume he had written it? Sadly, things were to get worse. It's actually by Shelley, whoever that is, Lady Mary tweeted to Daniel Blake later on this, week, on this most edifying of Twitter threads. Daniel, Lady Mary, and others might do well not to just immediately read Shelley's work, but also Richard Holmes' biography of Shelley. It really is excellent. But hold on, aren't we approaching this wrongly? Perhaps Twitter has a point. The Gansian is poor, and the references elsewhere in the poem, the Prime Minister Lord Castor Castellerg, are hardly topical. Moreover, the poem is the predictable go-to lefties dream of a revolution that never happens. In 1980, the Jam quoted these lines on their album Sound Effects, but I don't recall the British people rising up to oust Margaret Thatcher. Perhaps we need new poems for new times. Poetry, W.H. Auden wrote, makes nothing happen. Good point. You can count the number of revolutions started by poetry on the fingers of no hands. But Auden was wrong. Sometimes poetry is more effective than anything else, not in bringing lions out of their slumber as much as boneheads out of the woodwork. This was a editorial by Stuart Jeffries on The Guardian about people being stupid and <laughs> how they stay in history. <laughs> There once was a man from Nantucket. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I was going to do a limerick. Hey, okay, this day, in, this day in history brought to you by Britannica.com. Britannica.com, the one site I use. <laughs> I'm not going to write models. Okay, this day on June 29th in 1534, French mariner Jacques Cartier discovered Prince Edward Island off the coast of what was now Canada. He discovered it. Nobody knew it was there before. <laughs> oh my God, there's an island. And this French guy finally discovered it. Them Indians didn't notice it for all those centuries. 1767, Parliament passed the Townsend Revenue Act, sponsored by British Chancellor of the Exchequer, Charles Townsend, which Exchequer, I guess it's called. Charles Townsend, which opposed colonists in the British America 
and import tax on tea and other goods, and thus brought some colonists one step closer to the revolution. In 1861, English poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning died at the age of 55 from a severe chill. Wow, a severe chill. 1913, following a year of war with the Ottoman Empire, members of the victorious Balkan League quarreled over division of the conquered territories, resulting in the Second Balkan War, when Bulgaria attacked Greek and Serbian forces in Macedonia on this night, 110 years ago. In 1941, Stokely Carmichael, a civil rights activist and leader to black nationalism in the United States in 1960s, was born in Port of Spain, Trinidad. In 1974, while on tour with the Kirov, now Mar Marlinsky, ballet in Toronto, Mikhail Baryshnikov, ballet dancer, defected from the Soviet Union, citing artistic reasons, and he later settled in the United States. In 2003, American actress Katherine Hepburn died at the age of 96. In 2007, Apple Inc.'s first mobile smartphone, the iPhone, went on sale and it revolutionized the industry. In fact, I'm recording this on one of these smartphones right now and it's constantly making decisions for me I don't like. 2009, American hedge fund investment manager Bernie Madoff received a sentence of up to 150 years in prison for operating the largest Ponzi scheme in history. In 2020, in sad news, American actor, writer, and director Carl Reiner, who created the landmark TV series The Dick Van Dyke Show and later directed such popular comedies as The Jerk, died at the age of 98. So that was... Two years ago, three years ago, Carl Reiner died at the age of 98. He would be 101, obviously. And of course, yesterday was his best friend's birthday. So he died the day after his best friend's birthday. That uh, that would be Mel Brooks, his best friend. who turned 97. So it's sad that he died right after his friend's birthday. All right. Featured event today is London's Globe Theater destroyed by fire during a performance of William Shakespeare's Henry VIII on his day in 1613. The Globe Theater was destroyed within an hour after its a thatch was accidentally set aflame by a cannon marking the king's entrance on stage. Ooh, a stage prop started, started the theater on fire. It was destroyed. Birthdays today. Oh, here's one. The president of Sh Sri Lanka. Okay, I apologize for getting this completely wrong. Chandrika Bandarnaki Kamaratunga. It's her birthday. She's 78 today. Oh, here's another one. 1957, the president of Turkmenistan. <coughs> he was born. Here's his name. Garbungli Birdi Mukahamara. Bertie McHammerdolf. It's about 17 letters. And night we did uh, other birthdays. Ray Harryhausen, American filmmaker. Bernard Herman, American poster and conductor. And Leroy Anderson, American musician. And what what day is it today? Let's find out in our little surprise calendar thing. Not too many days today. It is. It is National Bomb Pop Day, which, you know, like them little multi-colored, multi-flavored, long, skinny icicle pops, whatever you want to call them, popsicles. National Almond Crunch, Almond Butter Crunch Day. Almond Butter really Crunch. Reach? Almond Butter Crunch and National Bomb Pop Day. Okay, well, it's National Camera Day, which everybody has one now on their phone. National Waffle Day, Waffle Iron Day. So it's National Waffle Iron Day, not Waffle Day. You were celebrating the irons themselves. So take your waffle iron out to dinner. National Handshake Day and International Day of the Tropics. And that's all the days it is today. Not a lot of exciting stuff unless you're a waffle iron. <laughs> well, I guess I'm gonna take my waffle iron out 
put a popsicle in it and uh, eat some <laughs> almond crunch. Uh, that's what I'm. That's my plan for today. And uh, yeah, that's you will see you on Friday for the end of the week. Have a good one out there. This has been Allison. Yep. That's my name. Yep, and this has been Roger in Smoky Smoky Midwest. Signing off June 29th, 2023 edition of the Comprehensive News of Planet Earth on Before Coffee. Be sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notify buttons and follow our other channels, Toxic Alley, History of Gravy, and Scratchy Old Records.